G'day cobbers, welcome back to the bush. In this episode of Lockout's Full Driving, we're looking at part two of the Arduino tutorial for beginners electrical fundamentals. Now this isn't going to be the easiest video to understand, especially for those of you who are out a technical or scientific background. But let me assure you, if you understand this now, you will be repaid in orders of magnitude further down the track. Having said that, let's get into the episode. Now first up, we're going to look at atoms and the Bohr model to describe atoms. Atoms are the smallest part of something which is still that element, in this case, aluminium. Now you recognize this from the periodic table, probably from secondary school, for some of us many, many years ago, and AL being aluminium. Now this is the atomic number and the atomic weight. Now we don't really have to worry about the atomic weight for electronics, but we do have to worry about the atomic number. Now. The atom consists of protons, neutrons, and electrons. In the case of aluminium, it has neutrons, 14 of those, protons, which are positively charged, 13 of those, and 13 electrons. So here's our neutrons right in the nucleus, right in the center. And now these are our protons, our positively charged protons. Now the electrons are much more than they actually orbit the nucleus in shells. So let's have a look at that. So we've got three shells here, and they're named K, L, and M. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but that's what the protocol is. Okay, so we have our core shells, and we have the one of most interest to us, which is called the valence shell. Now, you can only get a certain number of electrons per shell, and this is how you work it out. So the maximum number of electrons is 2n to the power 2, where n is the number of shells. So this is the first shell, second shell, and third shell. What that works out is the first shell, two electrons, second shell, eight electrons, Third shell, maximum 18 electrons. Fourth shell, 32 electrons, so on and so forth. Right here. Now we've sussed that out. Let's start arranging electrons in our aluminium atom. So our first shell, K, well, obviously, two electrons. Beauty. Okay, let's move on to our next core shell, L. Now that has eight electrons in that shell, maximum number. Two and eight, of course, is 10. We have 13 electrons in the aluminium atom, so that leaves us with three electrons in our valence shell. Our valence shell is the most important shell when it comes to working out electrical properties of that particular element, in this case, aluminium. Now let's check our conductors. Now I've chosen copper and silver as two examples. Copper has an atomic number of 29. So there's 29 protons in the middle, positively charged protons in the middle, in the nucleus, and orbiting around, well, in the various shells, there's 29 electrons. In the valence shell, shell M in this case, there's one electron, also known as the free electron. What about silver? Well, it has an atomic number of 47, so a different number of electrons and a different number of protons. But again, in shell O, in that valence shell, it only has the one electron, also known as the free electron. And you'll find that's the case with good electrical conductors. They have very few electrons in that outer valence shell. And now, semiconductors. So two I've chosen, silicon and germanium, common in things like transistors and integrated circuits. Silicon, atomic number 14. And that leaves us with four electrons in this valence shell. What about germanium? Well, germanium has an atomic number of 32. And again, that leaves us with a moderate amount, four electrons in that outermost valence shell. By now, you're probably seeing a bit of a pattern. But let's move on to insulators. Nitrogen and sulfur, both commonly used in the manufacturing process of electronic components. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven, so that leaves us with five electrons in this outermost valence shell. What about sulfur? Atomic number of 16, and that leaves us with six electrons in that outermost valence shell. So it seems the more electrically conductive an element is, the less number of electrons they have in the valence shell, and the less conductive they are, the better the insulator they are, the more electrons they have in the outermost valence shell. Now, so far, we've only dealt with atoms with the same amount of positively charged protons in the center as they have negatively charged electrons in these outermost shells. So there is no net charge because the positive number equals the negative number. So let's take aluminium. So it has 13 electrons in those shells and 13 protons in that nucleus in both of these atoms, so there is no electrical charge. But what about if we take away a negative atom? One of those three atoms? Well, now we have an imbalance. We have an excess of positive protons 
in the nucleus as we do have electrons in those outermost shells. So overall, we have a positive charge, and that's known as a cation. But what about if that electron moves over into the valence shell of our aluminium atom? Now we have an excess number of negatively charged electrons as we do have positively charged protons in that nucleus. So overall, we have a negative charge, and that is known as an ion. So how does this work in a circuit? Let's have a look at that. Now, if you're enjoying this content so far, consider subscribing. And don't forget to ring that bell icon so you don't miss out on future Arduino tutorials just like this one. Now, if you want early ad-free access to videos just like this, well, you can by becoming a patron on Patreon. There's a link down in the doobly-doo. Anyway, let's get back to the episode. And now we understand a little bit more about ions, we can understand how a circuit works, and that is electron flow. So at the positive end of our battery, we have atoms with an excess of positively charged protons in that nucleus and a deficiency in negatively charged electrons in those shells. So we have an overall positive charge in those atoms there. On the negative side of the battery, well, it's a complete opposite. We have an excess of negatively charged electrons and a deficiency in those protons. So we have an overall negative charge, but there's no connection in between the positive and the negative. Thankfully, otherwise we short out the battery. And we need to provide a path for those free electrons to flow. And unfortunately, right at the moment, well, we've got to switch there. So there is no path. But what happens when we close that switch? Well, what happens is those free electrons start moving through those conductors, enabling us to light up that globe and then reach back to the positive side. And what happens is it's trying to reach a state of equilibrium. Those atoms in that battery are trying to reach a state of equilibrium where all the positive charges and the negative charges in those atoms are exactly the same number and therefore it's neutral charge. And that's when your battery's flat. That's how electron flow works, or the basics of it anyway. Now let's have a look at voltage and current. And I'm going to use an analogy here. Here we have two water tanks and they have an interconnecting pipe with a valve which is shut and a water height difference between this tank and this tank. What we have is a potential difference. A potential difference in height in between this tank and this tank. Because this valve shut, no water flows. But if we open up the valve, well, of course, the water is going to flow from this tank via this pipe into this tank until we reach a state of equilibrium. But how's it going to do it? And how fast is it going to do it? Well, it depends on the diameter of this pipe here. The larger the diameter of the pipe, the faster we're going to reach that state of equilibrium. And we can think of current as the diameter of this pipe. So the larger the current, the more we can actually flow. And for our intents and purposes, that's the best way to describe voltage and current. And now question of the day. First person to answer correctly down in the comment section, I'll send you out a sticker anywhere in the world. <laughs> okay, now carbon atom has an atomic number of six, so it has four electrons in both its outermost valence shell. Now graphite is a very good conductor, one one hundred thousandth ohm meters, but carbon in its diamond configuration, well, it's a horrendous conductor of electricity. In fact, it's a very good insulator. 10 quadrillion ohm meters. Why is that? Drop the comment below. Now, if you got some value from this episode, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, by all means, give it a thumbs down. Not once, not thrice, but twice. Thanks, guys. We'll see you in the next one.